Coal seam gas ports and major infrastructure are another important component of the Queensland regulatory system. So in today's lecture, we are moving from mining and environmental impact assessment that we covered last week to focus on coal seam gas, ports and major infrastructure projects. So the good news is that today isn't anywhere near as hard as our previous lectures in the sense that a lot of the stuff we'll cover today is very similar to the mining framework. It's just that there's a different act and a few different licenses involved, but this, there's very similar concepts. So it's an important separate or interrelated area to mining and it, re and it uh, copies a lot of the concepts that existed under the mining regime. So that's, I'm sure you'll be happy to, to know that we're, today there isn't a lot of new ideas or new concepts to cover. And that's why I'm going to take a bit of time to pause and look at ports and major infrastructure as, a, as we progress through this course. So today, the problem I'm going to focus on is the Santos GLNG project. So Gladstone uh, Liquefied Natural Gas Projects. That's what the GLNG stands for. So I'll start with an overview of coal seam gas uh, liquefied natural gas industry in Queensland and then focusing on the Santos GLNG project ask the question well does the proposed activities comply with the law and if not what steps need to be taken to make them comply that general question I keep coming back to and so we'll ask the same sort of questions we've asked in earlier lectures what laws regulate these activities are any applications needed to gain government approval and then are the applications likely to be granted? And I want to spend a bit of time looking at the conditions of approval for a CSG project, just again, focusing on the importance of conditions. So today we're looking at uh, the coal seam gas LNG uh, industry in Queensland. There's been four big projects. Uh, these, this is from a, a, just a little summary from 2013 that was in the Courier Mail. So at that time there were um, four projects that were on the cards, the AP LNG, QC LNG, GLNG and Arrow. And the GLNG one is the one we're focusing on, that was a Santos project. So big resource companies. Uh, there was a real boom for gas development from about 2009 through to 2012. And the um, industry really opened up huge uh, resources in Queensland. It was very rushed at the time, like there was a huge sort of stampede to get these massive projects approved. And there's been a lot of criticisms of that approval process. And also effectively the deal that the state government negotiated for uh, royalties and also the impact that it's had on the price of gas within Australia because prior to the development of these big export gas industries in 2009 to 2012 Australia had uh, a large uh, gas uh, industry within Australia but it didn't export the gas so the big push in 2009 to 2012 was to develop big export facilities in Gladstone where the gas is taken from you know gaseous form and liquefied to make the volume much smaller so it can be transported long distances on ships so in doing that what happened was that the at Queensland effectively opened up the the price of gas in Australia was quite low because the gas sector only supplied Australian domestic industries and by exporting the gas, it meant that Australia became uh, linked to the international price of gas, which was much higher. So the whole price of gas in particular on the East Coast in Australia rose dramatically. And then that had flow on effects for the price of electricity uh, and other uh, you know, important price implications for industries in Queensland and in New South Wales and Victoria because gas is often used as a peaking plant in electricity generation. So it, it is an important uh, component of setting the price of electricity as well as direct use of gas in industrial processes. So this was a really significant change for the whole Australian economy and really driven by what happened in Queensland with these big projects. So the projects very soon after they 
really came online, they a lot of them suffered financial difficulty. And this is just an article from uh, 2015 uh, talking about what the LNG producers did wrong. And essentially, they invested a huge amount of capital in tens of 20s of, you know, uh, a number of the projects invested $20 billion in capital expenditure and then essentially had a lot of problems with um, recovering the money for that. So there's also a number of arguments about the gas sector that keep coming up and that gas, you know, it's often said that gas is a transition fuel for climate change, that we move from coal through gas to renewables. And yeah, it, there's a, again a lot of uh, criticism of that argument it's not really a transition fuel. Gas is pretty well the same amount of carbon intensity as coal when you take in fugitive emissions. So that is the, the loss of uh, gas into the atmosphere through the extraction process. So, so there's been a lot of uh, criticism, including just recently, uh, a, this is a really uh, important, I thought, article that I uh, noted just in February this year. It was a report about uh, from the ACCC, so that's the Australian um, Consumer Co Competition and, and Consumer Commission. So it's a statutory body set up to protect consumers uh, at, a, at a federal level. And it criticised the gas industry, accusing it of misleading governments into approving massive gas export projects that have led to soaring power prices, uh, killing off companies and jobs in Australia. And this is a quote from Rod Sims, the chairman of the ACCC, saying uh, he thinks that the gas industry as a whole certainly has to carry a lot of blame for the mess, and it's a mess that we are in, that companies are closing down, and the trouble is that it's causing Australian manufacturing and, uh, and job losses. And, you know, it's really significant. This is at a Australia-wide um, scale, and it's had a big impact. So the, the gas companies, my, my take on it was the gas companies really sweet talked the state governments in New South Wales and Queensland in 2009 through to 2012. Anna Bly was the premier in Queensland and they came in and said, you know, you'll be fine. Let us open up these big resources and link into an international market. You'll have a royalties bonanza. There'll be jobs bonanza. You'll gain all this money and, you know, domestic industries will be fine. And that's not what happened because as I said, the price of gas in Australia at a domestic level rose dramatically once we were linked into the international um, market. So this is just a continuation of that article from February. So electricity prices have risen steeply. Um, and this is just some of the quotes from that article. Um, a veteran of the gas industry agreed that the approval of the three ga giant gas export terminals was poor policy. Um, should all of those projects been approved with hindsight and retrospect, with um, foresight, no, and in retrospect, categorically, no. So basically, it's um, the gas producer's fault. They've overstated the reserves and they were just gung-ho about getting these things happening. And you know, this is only a decade ago too. This isn't like we're talking. You know, this is all with all our meg, with all our modern laws, regulatory system, governments in place, and you know, this basically monumental stuff stuff up still occurs. So yeah, it was a a fight that was lost ten years ago, and now essentially we've just got to live with it. So. Uh, and then this is just a continuation of it as well. Basically, bringing back affordable gas is tricky. Uh, so in a lot of countries, uh, there's different mechanisms used when big resource sectors are developed. So in Saudi Arabia, one of the big mechanisms that's used is that all uh, oil extraction and petroleum extraction must be done in conjunction with a state-owned company. And they you know, basically own, say, 50% of it. So the profits come in to the state-owned entity and Saudi Arabia essentially gets a huge amount of income from its petroleum sector, uh, whereas Australia hasn't achieved anywhere near that uh, in its development of uh, similar sort of um, petroleum resources and gas particularly. So, and the gas sector managed to uh, 
get state governments to agree not to have any gas reserve for domestic consumption. So basically the gas producers said, look, if you do that, we won't go ahead with it because we're investing you know, billions and billions of dollars in your states unless you basically allow us to um, you know, develop everything we've approved for and, and export it or sell wherever. It's not really market based and it's not really, uh, you know, it's not a good investment for us. So the state governments agreed to proceed without uh, any gas reserve for domestic consumption. And, and that was one of the aspects that's really uh, driven up the price of gas domestically. So, yeah, and a quote there, in a sense, the horse is bolted. Putting the horse back in the stable is going to be really difficult on this. So essentially, we've got an ongoing uh, major problem for domestic gas consumption in Australia. So I'll the links to that story is in um, the slides. So click on that and have a read of it. It's a very interesting, you know, it, environmental regulation isn't just about protecting the environment. There are also huge implications for the economy, for jobs, and there can be perverse outcomes. So in developing the gas sector 10 years ago, obviously the state and federal governments wanted to do, uh, you know, gain jobs and, and gain income for Australia and for Queensland and New South Wales. And the fact that they stuffed it up at such a massive level with billions of dollars of royalties lost and the huge implications for job losses as well as you know, power prices in Australia is a real, you know, it's, a, it's a huge lesson in the, the negative implications of um, resource development that don't necessarily seem obvious when you think about environmental regulation generally. So just to give you some background, Australia's natural resource, uh, you know, Australia's got massive natural resources. Here's a map of the natural gas basins spread across uh, Australia. And those red lines are gas pipelines. So there's, there were huge gas uh, extraction in southwestern Queensland and in uh, South Australia, uh, as well as uh, Northern Territory and WA as well and off the coast. So WA has huge offshore gas uh, production and in the south of Australia in Bass Strait. So down here between Tasmania and Victoria in Bass Strait, huge amount of offshore gas was developed as well. So that supplied a lot of the um, gas market, domestic gas market around Australia. And then in two, basically a decade ago, there was enormous development of coal seam gas in central uh, Queensland around Roma. So if we just focus in, here's the um, coal resources. I showed you this map in our last uh, lecture. So coal seam gas is associated with uh, coal deposits and essentially it's gas that can basically be produced from uh, the, the coal deposits. So you've got coal which is the solid but there's also gas there that you can extract which is mainly methane. So coal seam gas is, is intricately linked with the um, coal deposits around Australia. And here's a map of petroleum and coal seam gas deposits in Queensland and the pipelines. So again, you've got the southwestern corner of Queensland and big pipelines coming in all the way to Brisbane. And then there's these central ones uh, around Roma. And then there's gas pipelines running down from Townsville down to Gladstone and Mount Isa as well for industrial use. So here's a map of pipelines along the Queensland coast. Might be a bit hazy for you, but up here you've got Townsville and you've got pipelines basically running down from Moorumbah down to Gladstone and then inland to Roma and then also going into Brisbane. So yeah, there's a lot of maps and raw data on coal seam gas and there's some really great graphics that are available on this ABC website, basically looking at coal seam gas by the numbers. So basically uh, coal seam gas, the gas sector in uh, Australia was conventional gases uh, until basically a decade ago. So conventional gas is where you ex you extract the gas um, without, uh, it, it's generally a gas deposit or gas reservoir. And then coal seam gas was the, the 
technology to, do, to extract coal seam gas rapidly evolved in the last two decades, particularly driven by the US. And so coal seam gas technology allowed otherwise non-conventional gas extraction from coal seams particularly and other um, hydrocarbon uh, stores, so shale gas and those sorts of things. So coal seam gas extraction has risen massively and this graph shows really it growing from 2012 onwards and then it's basically exponential out to 2030 was the projections. So here's, you can basically go onto this website and it will show you all the pipelines and wells and leases and um, petroleum leases and applications. So if I just zoom in, uh, here's a map showing, so if I go back, here's the actual leases granted and sorry, here's the actual leases gr granted in sort of orange. So all through central Queensland around the Galilee Basin and the like. So if we focus in on the southeast corner, there's huge areas that are covered by petroleum leases. So this is allowing for coal seam gas extraction as well as, well as other petroleum. So can I focus in on one of those big projects? So the Santos GLNG project, just to, to sink our teeth into one of the you know, big projects and get an idea of uh, how it fits together. Uh, Santos has got its uh, really good website. You can go and have a look at it. Just do a search for Santos GLNG. And this was an image of the first uh, GLNG shipment going out in October 2015. So as, the, as I said, the development of these projects occurred from 2009 through to, through to 2012. That was really the approval phase. And then they went through several years of construction. And this was the first shipment in 2015. So here's a map showing, uh, we've got Brisbane here, and then inland around Roma, there's all of these uh, extraction uh, areas for coal seam gas, and they are linked to the coast through a gas pipeline. So, and it goes out through Gladstone. So that's essentially, and there's also linked, Roma is linked in through a gas pipeline in as well to Brisbane but most of the export goes out through Gladstone. So the development of these projects involved the development of the, the wells where gas is extracted from the ground and then a pipeline to take the gas to the coast, uh, to the, the port of Gladstone, and then facilities to turn the gas into liquid and put it on ships in Gladstone. And then the ships take it to you know, markets in Japan or China or wherever. So let's just work through those steps. So the gas wells and pipelines are uh, shown in these sorts of images. And yeah, the uh, GLNG project, the capital expenditure was about $60 billion. So a huge amount of money. And so we're going from the Roma area here, about 500 kilometers to the coast. So you're covering a huge amount of ground. Uh, and at Gladstone, uh, there's, I'll be talking about Curtis Island. So Gladstone, if you've been up to Gladstone, it's a city with um, coal export facilities and a whole range of industries, a power station. And Curtis Island is a little island just basically immediately opposite Gladstone. And in the southwest corner of Curtis Island, all of the big LNG um, liquid, the, the, the facilities that turn the gas into liquid have all been built on the southwest corner of Curtis Island. So here's focusing in on that southwest corner. There was the AP LNG site, QC LNG and GLNG. And then Arrow, I don't think Arrow went ahead in terms of building its own. So they all decided that they would build their own uh, facilities for um, liquef liquefaction. And with foresight and with hindsight, that was a you know, they, they should have shared the facilities uh, and they've suffered significant financial uh, problems because essentially they all saw it as a bonanza and um, overcapitalized basically. So here's looking at Curtis Island. Gladstone is off here in the corner. So this is the southwest corner of, of Curtis Island looking south. You can see the AP LNG um, site this is back from would have been about 2012 this image is taken when the sites are being cleared and a lot of construction work 
is going on, the QC LNG site in the middle, and then G LNG site um, further south. So here's uh, the G LNG site. This is looking west. Um, so you can see this, this this image is taken in 2013. So massive site, a lot of work going on. You can see there the, the coastline. So again, you can go and have a look at the project website and you know look at what's going on there, updated photographs, those sorts of things. So here's an image from 2015 when essentially the first, um, it was nearing completion, so it had gone from, you know, cleared site through to this, this massive facility for liquefying the gas. So there are a large amount of jobs for you know, people in our sector, uh, environmental managers, environmental scientists, engineers, all working on those projects and, and still working on these, these projects with the implementation of the license conditions. So here's a you know, sort of picture you'll see on the websites with you know, lots of pipes going everywhere for the um, gas production. And then most LNG is exported. So, and you see these massive ships look, look like big bubbles and the like. So what uh, you can play any sort of number of videos, you can go onto the websites, it'll show you basically the, the journey of coal seam gas to liquefied nat natural gas. Um, but I won't play those um, now. You can have a look at them and I'll just talk you through them. Also, uh, a lot of the companies invested in a lot of uh, public relations. So they were very controversial at the time. A lot of landholders opposed them uh, because of the amount of impacts on farmlands. So uh, they spent a lot of money on public relations. This was a screen grab of a website for the uh, APLNG um, project, they engaged Darren Lockyer. So for folk who aren't from Queensland, Darren Lockyer was a very famous uh, Queensland uh, uh, rugby or um, rugby league player, um, played for Queensland for many years, played for the Broncos in Brisbane, was really popular, a really nice guy. Uh, and essentially, so that he was from the Roma area, so they engaged uh, Darren Lockyer to essentially talk to people so you could click on um, their website and play little clips of Darren saying you know I was a bit worried about this to start with but I went out to the land I met with you know the the company and they turn out to all be good guys and they're doing good work and you should all be you know you don't have to be concerned about it because it's it's all okay so obviously Darren Lockyer doesn't come with any expertise in groundwater or or environmental sciences the like, he's engaged basically as a public face to try and get the community on board with it. So the whole social license aspect of it was a major consideration in the um, assessment and approval and ongoing relationships for these companies. So can I just unpack what coal seam gas is a little bit? Because if you're like me, before I you know really looked at the industry, I didn't really know what it was. So I just want to spend a couple of minutes clarifying it. So coal seam gas, uh, or coal bed methane, it's sometimes called overseas, but here we call it really coal seam gas. It's a form of natural gas, typically extracted from coal seams at depths of 300 to 1000 meters. It's colorless, odorless, and a mixture of a number of gases, but it's mostly made up of methane. So it's usually more than 95% pure methane, so CH4. So CSG was made over 200 million years ago when the coal was being formed, and it's been held in the coal since then by water pressure. To get the gas out, you first need to remove the water, and this reduces the pressure in the coal seam, enabling the gas to flow. <coughs> Excuse me. So... The depths there are significant, so it's extracted at you know 300 to 1,000 meters. If if the coal was higher than that, closer to the surface, it could well be worth digging down and extracting the coal through an open, you know, open cut mine. So a lot of mines in Queensland, you know, you you dig down, you dig up all the coal, you get more from doing that. So 300 to 1,000 meters, it's it's beyond a depth where it's economically 
worthwhile because you if it's at th if the coal's at 300 meters if you're going to do an open cut mine you would have to take 300 meters of dirt off the top of it you can go underground and you know go down and mine shafts and extract the coal in an underground mine uh, but coal seam gas is another way of getting a lot a lot of the um, hydrocarbons out of the coal without going to the expense of um, putting down a, a, a mine shaft. So it's another way essentially of accessing the, the hydrocarbons in the coal seams. If you have an open cut mine, you still have um, coal seam gas. A lot of it is lost. If you dig up a, a coal seam, a lot of it will just be lost in fugitive emissions. So it just basically, as you break up the coal, the gas basically is given off. And in underground mines, uh, coal seam gas, so an underground mine shaft, coal seam gas can be really dangerous and explosive. So there's, if you're in mine shaft, if you're working in an underground coal mine, then there'll typically be a lot of um, protective measures to remove the methane because yeah, if it gets too much and there's a spark, it will just explode. So coal seam gas is associated with normal mining. It's just that when we focus on coal seam gas as the method of extraction, it's typically in these um, deeper um, deposits that it's not viable to extract in other ways. So essentially there were deposits that weren't, weren't going to be extracted through other means and we're getting essentially the hydrocarbons out of them through coal seam gas. So you have to with, remove the water uh, to get the gas out. So just as an aside, natural gas, uh, what is it? So it's a com it's natural gas is a combustible mixture of hydrocarbon gases, and it's primarily made of methane, but it also includes ethane, propane, butane, and pentane. And the composition of natural gas can vary widely, but this is a chart showing the, the typical sort of makeup. And when they process gas, an, an important component of the processing is to essentially get the consistency um, more consistent so that it can be burnt with similar sorts of properties. But yeah, methane is typically the major component. So liquefied natural gas then, what's that? So if you cool natural gas to about minus 162 degrees Celsius at normal pressure, it means that it changes from gas to liquid form. Uh, so liquefied natural gas. So it's particularly useful for transporting natural gas since it takes up about one six hundredth of the volume of gaseous natural uh, gas. So that's why we turn it into a liquid is so it can be transported and then when you get to the other end, say it gets transported to Japan, you turn it back into gas to burn it. So what's the difference between CSG and conventional natural gas might be another question you have. Well, there's different forms of natural gas and they're generally called either conventional or unconventional gas. So conventional natural gas and CSG are chemically similar. CSG is almost pure methane and conventional natural gas is around 90% methane. The main difference between conventional natural gas and CSG is the type of reservoir from which they're produced. So conventional natural gas reservoirs like in Bass Strait largely consist of porous sandstone formations capped by impermeable rock and the gas is stored in the sandstone at high pressure and so it can flow to the surface through a production well at a high flow rate often without the need of a pump so that's Bass Strait or you know other areas that you know of with natural gas production. CSG though it's often called unconventional natural gas because it's not stored in these conventional sandstone reservoirs. So CSG is contained in the fine structures or natural fractures of coal seams and movement of CSG to the surface through gas wells normally requires extraction of the water that's also in those to basically reduce the pressure on the gas and allow the gas to flow. So water extraction reduces the pressure on the coal seam and allows the gas to be released from the coal. And yeah, over time, water production decreases and gas production increases from each well. So if you see an image of a calcium gas well, it'll look like this. So obviously that's just what's on the surface. And then it's got, this is another one. So a calcium gas well, another image of a calcium gas well on a, looks like a cattle property there. And so here's a diagram of what's happening there. So 
Uh, here you've got the pump at the top. Obviously this isn't to scale. And you extract the water and take the gas off. And so this is you know, down 300 meters to 1,000 meters underground. You've drilled down to the coal seam and you extract the water and then you also extract the gas. So that's what you're doing. Here's another diagram of it, um, a pump with a separator, you know, extracting the gas and then also extracting the water. And yeah, it's essentially the little fractures in the coal seam is where the gas comes out. It's typically, yeah, 200, that, that image or that diagram says typically 200 to 1,000 meters underground. So there's a whole, whole range of environmental concerns associated with coal seam gas, LNG. Um, groundwater disposal of this, the saline wastewater. Fracking, um, but um, note that fracking isn't used in all CSG projects. Uh, habitat loss and fragmentation, loss of agricultural land, port expansion, including dredging. Uh, increased shipping through the Great Barrier Reef was another real concern with this uh, sector when it was developed a decade ago, as well as contribution of greenhouse gases to climate change. So a whole range of environmental concerns associated with it. So just dealing with some of those. In terms of land and habitat fragmentation, you can see here an image of roads and well sites for CSG. So, you know, when you just see one um, CSG well and it's only like a couple of metres you know, it looks so small and the footprint that is there is, you know, maybe 10 metres by 10 metres. So you think, oh, well, that's not too big. But then if there's thousands of those wells spread across the landscape, plus the roads to connect them, you end up with this massive amount of fragmentation and vegetation loss for the wells and the roads because it's not just an individual well, it's thousands of them. So here's an image from Shoalhaven in New South Wales, and you can just see the number of wells there, um, and plus the roads joining them. So huge amount of habitat loss and fragmentation. Another big concern that was raised, particularly by um, farmers, was the massive amount of water that is used by CSG. It's not really used, it's that it's extracted, and then you've got to do something with it. So you take the water out to get the, the CSG, but that also means that once you've taken it out, you're taking out huge volumes, you've got to do something with it. And it's typically quite brackish, so quite a lot of salt in it. So what do you do with it? You just can't you know, tip it into a creek normally. Uh, so what do you do? Um, there's been a range of different things that have been done with it, um, from you know, putting it into, into a big holding pond and evaporating it, through to treating it and selling it to farmers to use. Um, if you can get down the salinity enough, um, also disposal in, um, in rivers as well. So you've got, to, you've got to do something with it and the volumes involved are enormous. So yeah, there's a massive water use by calcium gas and there are a whole range of different estimates from basically the gas companies had pretty low estimates uh, and then other um, bodies sort of looked at what would be the extraction from the groundwater systems, particularly the Great Artesian Basin. So in Australia, there's a massive um, groundwater system called the Great Artesian Basin, which is really significant for a lot of farming as well as ecologically. And um, it is interconnected. Uh, and a lot of the calcium gas is basically overlapping with that area. And so if you're extracting huge amounts of water from the groundwater, systems it can have an impact at a basin wide scale so yeah here's the bowen base sorry here's the great artesian basin in stripes and then here are all of the um, petroleum leases and extraction wells across it so you've got a huge area of the great artesian basin and a huge amount of water that's been extracted another as i said one, another one of the concerns is dealing with the salt um, and uh, finally, another of the huge issues is climate change. So uh, I've said in previous lectures, our energy policy is basically to extract and burn all of our coal, gas and petroleum. So this is a graph from a uh, Australian energy white paper from tw uh, 
2008 or 2012. Um, but essentially what you see here is the projected extraction going out to 2035 and it will continue, you know, the idea is it will continue going further than that, but it, this graph only went to 2035. Um, at the bottom in orange, you've got uranium. So that's uh, Australia produces uranium from a number of uranium mines. So that's pretty constant. Then coal production was projected to increase. So that's black is coal projected to increase out to 2035. And then gas production, you can see here in the red bars at the top. And that was also projected to increase and you know go on for decades or out to a century. So our plan is to dig up and burn all of our um, coal and gas uh, over the next century. And of course that has runs you know head first into dealing with climate change um, but i'll park that I'll, as i've said in previous lectures i'm going to come back to climate change in lecture 10 and let's focus on the reality of how these projects are assessed they're not stopped because of climate change they you know they typically take climate change into account in a cur in a cursory sort of way and then get a tick um, from regulators in relation to their climate change impacts so let's focus on um, the laws that regulate these activities and then the application processes. So if we think about the diagram of uh, the major laws in, or ma the Queensland legal, environmental legal system that I've given you in previous uh, lectures, and um, there's an, a, a number of laws that regulate mining and petroleum so at a commonwealth level there's the environment protection biodiversity conservation act again come back to that uh, later on in lecture nine there's also at a state level a number of um, pieces of legislation last week we talked about the mineral resources act for mining but for um, petroleum which includes um, coal seam gas the main Act for 10 years is the Petroleum and Gas, and then in brackets, Production and Safety Act 2004. And then other acts that we also talked about last week, so the Environmental Protection Act, um, State Development Public Works Organisation Act. Can I just mention as we go at, at this point, so mostly we're focused in this course on domestic laws and what an important reason for that is that generally, while Australia has a whole range of international legal obligations to protect the environment, including the world under the World Heritage Convention and the Biodiversity Convention and, and the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the like, and we know that at an international level there's United Nations, the reality is that um, there's very little international oversight of activities in uh, individual countries, that one of the basic principles under international law is that countries have sovereignty and they can control activities within their own borders. So in Australia, the Australian government and state governments control activities within our borders and we don't need approval from an international body to approve something like a coal seam gas production or a port expansion or something like that. That's the, the general rule. There was this unusual thing happened though in associated with the development of the coal seam gas sector in an expansion of ports back in 2012, which involved some international oversight and it had quite significant implications for Australia and planning for ports in particular along the Queensland coast. So I'll just mention it. So back in 2012, when the whole gas sector was uh, exploding, I shouldn't use the word exploding um, with gas, but in, essentially there was this massive expansion of coal seam gas going on from 2009 to 2012. And that led to major expansions of ports. There was also at that time a big expansion of the coal sector. So there were whole heap of proposals for more ports along the Queensland coast adjacent to the Great Barrier Reef. That led to concerns by the World Heritage Committee, which is the international body um, of countries under the World Heritage Convention. 
Uh, and so the, under the World Heritage Convention, the World Heritage Committee essentially is the major um, body that um, approves properties being listed on the World Heritage List, but also can designate properties as uh, World Heritage in danger. And the World Heritage Committee became concerned about the development along the Queensland coast impacting the Great Barrier Reef. And it led them to uh, ask Australia if they could send a mission to report on what was happening. So Australia dutifully uh, invited, you know, it wasn't really a request, it was a request, but a sort of request. Australia has been a, um, a very strong uh, advocate of the World Heritage Regime, and we've got a whole range of World Heritage properties. And so politically, uh, Australia wants to be seen as very supportive of the World Heritage Regime. So when the World Heritage Committee expressed concern and asked uh, if Australia would invite a monitoring mission, Australia then complied with that request and invited uh, the um, World Heritage Committee to send a monitoring mission. So two people came out and they wrote a report that talked about uh, essentially the part of the report said it is clear that the scale of coastal development currently being proposed and consented presents a significant risk to the Great Barrier Reef and that the scale and pace of development proposals appears beyond the capacity for independent quality and transparent decision making. So the World Heritage Committee was considering um, listing the Great Barrier Reef as World Heritage in Danger. And just to give you context, so along the Queensland coast, there are a number of major ports. At um, There's the port of Brisbane, which is further south on this map. But within the Great Barrier Reef, there's Gladstone, which is right at the southern end of the Great Barrier Reef. So the Great Barrier Reef is obviously shown in this um, figure beside the Queensland coast. So it basically runs from Gladstone all the way to the top of Cape York. So within that area, there's Gladstone at the south. And then at Mackay, there's Dalrymple Bay and Hay Point, which are major coal loading facilities. And then Abbott Point, uh, which is just north of Bowen, which is again another major coal loading facility. Townsville has also got a significant or a major port. And back in 2012, there was a propo proposal for some new coal terminals, one called the Fitzroy Terminal Project, which is a new um, coal port just north of Gladstone. And another was the Balakava Island Coal Export Terminal, which again was a new um, facility just north of Gladstone. And then there was also the Wongai um, project, which was a new facility right up north of Cairns in uh, yeah, a, a relatively pristine part of the Great Barrier Reef. So these major coal bulk ports are shown in white in that image and the major new ports in red. These are the ones that were proposed in 2012. So the World Heritage Committee reviewed the reactive management report and accepted the recommendations, um, but decided not to enter the Great Barrier Reef on the list of World Heritage in Danger at that stage, requested Australia to report further on developments. And that then led the Australian and Queensland governments to do a, a, a whole heap of um, planning for port development, as well as um, the help, monitoring the Great Barrier Reef health. So the committee requested that Australia not permit any new port development or associated infrastructure outside of the existing and long established major port areas within or adjoining the property. So in particular, just north of Gladstone. So we're going to talk, show you, we've talked about Gladstone already. Um, so that's Gladstone and then Curtis Island is here. And so the LNG facilities are in this Southwest corner of Curtis Island, but north of Curtis Island, um, in the mouth of the Fitzroy River. So here's Rockhampton. The mouth of the Fitzroy River, there was proposed new coal terminals. So the Fitzroy Terminal Project and Balaclava Island. So both of those were proposed. Those were the sorts of projects that the World Heritage Committee was asking Australia not to proceed with. So who knows what would have happened um, if it had really come push come to shove. But what, what did in fact happen was that those projects went away naturally in the sense that the coal boom really died after 2013. And in 2014, 2015, the price of coal had 
fallen and the outlook had really changed. Renewables were becoming uh, much cheaper the out and climate policy was so significant and the whole outlook for the coal sector changed and those big port expansion projects died or went into abeyance. You know, they're still, I'm sure they're still there somewhere uh, in on some company's books ready to come back if the price of coal comes back up and it becomes economically worthwhile to do them. But essentially they didn't proceed for commercial reasons and Australia did a range of planning uh, and Queensland did a range of planning, but it coincided with the fact that these projects just went away for commercial reasons. So, yeah, I just mentioned that because it's a it was significant from 2012 through to about 2014 with the World Heritage Committee playing a role and getting involved in what effectively was domestic level planning. Um, by a national government uh, under the World Heritage um, Convention. It very rarely, it, it's very rare that that happens. Generally, projects are assessed and approved by national governments implementing the, their international obligations as they see fit. So if Australia was to approve those projects and say, well, we are doing this consistent with our international obligations, then generally the international community wouldn't become involved. So because of the controversy around this, you know, so painted the picture that this was massive um, amount of development going on. It led to a lot of concern in the farming sector in particular. And in 2013, it led to uh, an extra trigger being created for matters of national environmental significance in the Commonwealth Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. Basically, uh, an independent Tony Windsor um, negotiated with the Gillard government at the time to to include this extra trigger so that um, coal projects but also coal seam gas projects that are likely to have a significant impact on water resources have an independent trigger under the EPBC Act. I'll come back to the EPBC Act in Lecture 10 but I just mention that as part of your, so painting the picture of this massive development of this sector and all of the regulatory responses to it at an international level, then at a national level, and then down at a state level. I noted last week in relation to mining that there's no offshore mining or petroleum industry in Queensland. And the reason for that is that mining and oil and gas exploration and extraction have been prohibited in the GBR Marine Park since the 1970s. So most of the Queensland coast you can't mine, you can't extract petroleum. So yeah, that huge chunk, that red line basically shows the outer uh, limits of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. Um, and yeah, so you can't extract uh, or yeah, even explore for petroleum or minerals in that area. So let's then turn to the state regimes. Uh, so the state regimes are generally the most important in practice and understanding and distinguishing between them um, is you know, something I want to focus on. I just noticed that it's right on 10 o'clock. Uh, shall we take a five minute break? Do you guys want to jump in? That'd be good. Yeah, let's take a five minute break and then yeah. we'll come back and we'll dive into the state regimes. Uh, so um, five or 10 minutes? Five is fine. Five is okay. Okay, we'll go and get a, grab a cup of coffee. I'll go and grab a cup of coffee too. And we'll come back in five minutes. So welcome back to the second half of our lecture. So before the break, we were talking about generally the calcium gas uh, sector, the, the petroleum sector and understanding the components of it. So we know that there is the wells where the, the calcium gas is pulled out of the ground and then pipelines to take the gas to the coast. And then there's also was this huge development uh, of the facilities for turning the gas into a liquid uh, in, constructed in Gladstone. So I want to turn to look at the state regimes for basically regulating those different parts of this, these projects. So mentioned last week, the Mineral Resources Act. So the Mineral Resources Act you, you can think of it the way I think of it, because as I said last week, the definitions of minerals 
uh, similarly, the definition of petroleum is a fairly abstract. The way I simply think of it is the Mineral Resources Act covers minerals like uh, gold and coal, sorry, gold and silver and uh, things like um, some of the heavy metals like rutile and the likes. So there's a whole range of minerals. So, um, but generally solid things. Um, and in relation to coal, you can think of it as solid hydrocarbons. So petroleum and gas um, deals with hydrocarbons that are in um, gaseous or liquid form. So if, you, if you're trying to extract uh, gas, so coal and gas, then you're basically regulated under the Petroleum and Gas Production and Safety Act. So that's the distinction I use really for coal and petroleum and gas is think of the Mineral Resources Act as covering the solid state and then petroleum and gas is as regulating effectively the liquid or gaseous states. That's the rule of thumb that I, I use. Uh, the Environmental Protection Act. So the Mineral Resources Act and the Petroleum and Gas Act deal with the tenure aspects of it as well as royalties. Um, the Environmental Protection Act deals with the environmental uh, protection issues uh, and these activities require an environmental authority. The Regional Planning Interests Act 2014, so it really missed the whole expansion of these big sectors in 2009 to 2012. A lot of them were already largely approved when the Regional Planning Interests Act came into force. So I won't really, I spent a bit of time on the Regional Planning Interests Act last week, but and I, I've got a few slides just mentioning it um, coming up, but the projects like GLNG were largely approved before the Regional Planning Interest Act came into force. The State Development Public Works Organisation Act provides EIS for big projects. And then there's the Commonwealth EPBC Act as well. So um, I gave you this diagram last week. So we're outside of National Park. And so planning is over here regulated under the Planning Act. So if we're going after calcium gas, then we're not in that big regime. We're in the mining and petroleum regime, which involves land access and tenure and royalty issues dealt with under, um, particularly for petroleum and gas, the Petroleum and Gas Production and Safety Act, as well as there's an act called the Mineral and Energy Resources Common Provisions Act, which is important for land access. Then environmental issues are regulated under the Environmental Protection Act and regional interests regulated under the Regional Planning Interest Act. So we're in this whole regime again, but in relation to petroleum and gas. So I mentioned last week as well that um, mining or mining and petroleum activities are accepted development under the Planning Act. Therefore, they don't require approval under that act. So the key to identifying what is mining or what is petroleum is basically working out whether you are looking, whether you are seek, whether the activity is seeking to extract a mineral, uh, and then you're under the mining regime. And similarly, if you are looking to extract petroleum, you're under the petroleum regime. And both of those acts have quite abstract definitions, but for for coal, you can think of it as a solid hydrocarbon. Petroleum, you can think of it as liquid or gas uh, hydrocarbons. If you're basically trying to get them, if that's the purpose of your activity, then you're not regulated under the planning regime. Does that make sense? And don't worry if, if it doesn't really make sense. It's, you know, the, the, our regime is a combination of a result of sort of the artifacts of history the mining regime was developed over a century ago in early versions of it to basically allow the state to grant access for the development of mineral resources on land that other people owned. So it was all about getting access to resources and the petroleum regime really copied that and it has developed as its own sort of area separate to the planning regime, but obviously they're interrelated in the sense that they, you know, they're both regulating activities within the same geographic area. So the differences between them aren't 
aren't always logical and it can seem quite strange why something is under the planning regime. So if you are a quarry, if someone wants to extract hard rock from a big quarry, then you're under the planning regime. But if you have a, essentially the same as a quarry, but you're going after coal or a mineral in the rock, then what looks like the same activity uh, on the surface, you know, there's a big hole in the ground, there's a lot of heavy machinery, they're breaking up the ground and processing it. But if you're going after a mineral at that site, you aren't regulated under the Planning Act you're, for the mineral extraction, you're regulated under the mining regime. So it's not entirely um, logical and so the, the main thing is to just understand the different regimes and I hope that particularly this little flowchart is helpful for you in basically just separating out. I, I was thinking it's it might be a bit like um, in terms of language, is it irregular verbs? You know that one of the prob one of the challenges for people learning English is to learn the irregular verbs, the, the verbs that don't really follow a set rule. You just have to learn them. So this is similar um, in a way. It's basically just identifying what's mining and petroleum. And sometimes that's not entirely logical. Okay. Let's go on then. So if we're in the petroleum regime, if we're going after coal seam gas, we we look at the definition, we find that that constitutes uh, extracting petroleum. And we then are in the Petroleum and Gas um, Act and the Environmental Protection Act. So let's just look at, unpack some of those um, bits of legislation. So as I said, the major laws regulating coal seam gas extraction Petroleum and Gas Production and Safety Act, and that deals with tenure and royalty issues. The Environmental Protection Act deals with environmental protection. And then the Mineral and Energy Resources Common Provisions Act basically dealt with some overlapping issues and particularly land access, as well as the Water Act um, also deals with make good obligations for impacts on groundwater bores. So the main tenures, just to summarize them, and I don't want to go into the Petroleum and Gas Production and Safety Act, for our, the purposes of our course, I'm really happy if you just are basically aware of the regimes and can identify a few of the basic things associated with them. So know that flowchart, you know that there's this whole area of planning that's dealt with under the Planning Act. So development other than mining and petroleum is dealt with under the Planning Act. But if you're doing mining or petroleum, then you're under these other regimes. For coal seam gas, the three or well, two main tenures to be aware of. Uh, so under the mining regime, you might remember from last week, there was an exploration permit for the exploration stage. Under the petroleum regime, it's not called an exploration permit. It's called an authority to prospect or an ATP. So those are generally granted for a large area and you know they might involve drilling, they might involve other things uh, looking for the resource and that if you've got an if you're a company with an authority to prospect then you can gain access to land that's you know say a big cattle property where the, the property owner doesn't want you to come onto their land and they don't want their land developed but the authority to prospect gives you essentially a legal right to go onto the land. You, you've got to provide notice and there's a range of things you've got to comply with, but essentially, even if they object, you've got a right to go onto their land and explore for petroleum under the authority of the authority to prospect. So that's exploration. But when you get to actually extracting the resource for commercial production, you need what's called a petroleum lease. So similar in terms isn't it to last week we were talking about minerals and it was a mining lease <clears throat> similarly for petroleum you need a petroleum lease and then there's also under the petroleum and gas legislation there's also a pipeline license so this is essentially giving you tenure to you know if you've got a pipeline running you know, three or four hundred kilometers you are going to cross hundreds or thousands of individual properties. So you're going to have to negotiate with those landholders 
and you don't want to be stopped by one landholder who refuses to give you access over their land. So a pipeline license is again a procedure for allowing you to negotiate and if they refuse to agree then you can go to court um, or you know you, it gives you a mechanism to uh, get access um, through the legal process rather than necessarily uh, allowing any landholder along the way to basically block your whole pipeline because obviously a pipeline if there's one kilometer along the 400 kilometers that you can't get access across the whole pipeline wouldn't work so those are the main tenures to be aware of under that act and I don't really want to go into the process any more than that. I'd just like you to be aware of them um, and the act that's there and um, I'm going to focus more on the environmental authority in a moment. Um, the Mineral and Energy Resources Common Provisions Act provides a land access code which provides general principles for landholder and resource company negotiations and land access. And it also provides for what are called conduct and compensation agreements. And they're negotiated with individual landholders and have become a really a central instrument for regulating land access and compensation for petroleum activities. And I heard a figure a few weeks ago that there's around 2,500 CCAs in Queensland. So there's, you know, there is a lot of work in this area um, for um, yeah, for essentially the resource companies in negotiating all of these things with individual landholders. So the land access code, I've just basically taken the front cover and its table of contents. It's about 30 pages long, giving you the link. I don't want to go into these in any detail, but I want you to be aware of them for, you know, if you're going to work for a resource company, say when you graduate, you go and work for Santos, and you're dealing with, uh, you know, you're working on a pipeline or in CSG fields, you know, say you're an environmental scientist and you're there looking after groundwater. Well, when you, you know, go about your daily work and you need to go onto a property, well, you have to comply with the land access code. So it has general principles about negotiations and good relations between landholders and resource companies. Uh, also, general things about induction training, access points, not spreading weeds, livestock and property management, those sorts of things. They're all dealt with because essentially for a lot of these areas, you've got big cattle properties which are operating um, as a sort of base level. And then on top of that, there's um, coal seam gas extraction occurring. And so the two have to operate together. And the land access code is an important component of that. Don't need to go into the details beyond that. There's, if you are really interested in this area, let's just say you're working or looking to work in the petroleum sector, you know, in coal seam gas, then there's a really useful summary of the land access provisions in a 30 page little booklet called a guide to land access in Queensland. And I've given you the link there in the slides, but you could just do a search for that. It's a good little summary for the purposes of our course. I don't, I don't need you. I don't want you to, I, know, I don't want to fill your, you know, fill us up with a whole heap of useless details. What I want us want you guys to be aware of is the is the broad frameworks, the broad things that regulate them, so that you know when you're working, uh, you know that you can go and find the details if you need to find them. Um, but there's a whole heap of um, regulation around accessing land and the relationships between resource companies and uh, landholders. Okay, so that's the tenures. You need a authority to prospect for exploration. You need a petroleum lease for the actual extraction. But it's the Environmental Authority under the Environmental Protection Act that provides the major environmental protection regimes. So talked a little bit about the Environmental Protection Act last week in relation to mining. And I'll talk about it more next week in relation to environmental harm which are the general offence provisions. But can I just unpack that a bit more? So the Environmental Protection Act, you can think of it as containing multiple regulatory tools. It's got things called environmental protection policies. It's got an EIS process for mining and petroleum activities. It's got 64 prescribed environmentally relevant activities that are integrated into the Planning Act, but also um, involve like gas production and those sorts of things are also ERAs. Uh, it's got separate, a sort of, 
separate regime for mining and petroleum activities that isn't integrated into the Planning Act. But um, yeah, so you can have a, if you're operating a, um, a gas facility, or let's just say you're operating one of the ERAs, like a wastewater treatment facility, then you require a development approval under the Planning Act, and it's also assessed under the Environmental Protection Act. So that's the prescribed ERAs. If you are um, doing a petroleum activity, then you require an environmental authority that's just basically dealt with under the Environmental Protection Act, and it isn't integrated then into the Planning Act. There's also a range of other um, tools in the Act, like a general environmental duty. I'll talk more about that next week. Uh, environmental protection orders, financial assurances. There's contaminated land management provisions as well that, again, I'll talk more about next week. Um, a whole range of offences associated with them. So you can think of it as this Act with this, all these tools for environmental management. And I just want to drill down in this lecture and think more about our environmental authority conditions. Again, we talked a bit about them last week in relation to mining and the New Ackland coal mine. And I made the point in that context that the, ER, that the environmental authority didn't attach a map of the stage two uh, pits. And therefore the mining company had this argument that it could mine anywhere within its mining lease. It didn't matter what it had applied for because no map was attached that gave it a implied authority to basically mine anywhere uh, within its mining lease provided it complied with its other conditions of the environmental authority and I said that that's wrong but that was the argument so we talked a bit about environmental authority last week but can I just basically look at EA for one of these Santos GLNG so um, I've, I've uploaded this to the Blackboard site in the lecture tab so you can have a look at it. So I had to obtain this from the state government registry. It's a document from 2013, so it still refers to one of the old parts of the Act before 2013. It went through this big amendments. So it talks about Chapter 5A, Petroleum Activity. So that's just part of the old older regime. But the core of it, the substance is still basically the same. So the EA identifies the activity on the front. You've got a, a license number, call, you've got the project name, so Roma Shallow Gas Project Area. And then you can see here the resource authority types and numbers. So you can see there the authority to prospect as well as petroleum leases and there's a whole range of references there. So that's the link across to the tenures uh, and then a date and it's signed. And then it gives, you, it gives some additional advice on what other things you will require, or that, that is the company will require. Um, so, uh, sorry, uh, rephrase that. It talks about what this um, approval uh, authorizes and talks about different environmentally relevant activities that are authorized under this. So basically, you know, those good principles for writing authorities is to be clear on exactly what you're approving. It's got a whole range of other things to start with, but I just wanted to look at the normal way these EAs are written is a series of schedules that deal with different um, aspects of them. So schedule A is general, then schedule B, underground gas storage, schedule C, water, schedule D, dams, Schedule E, land. Schedule F, environmental nuisance. Um, schedule uh, G, air. Um, waste, rehabilitation, monitoring programs, community issues, notification procedures and definitions. So it goes on for 78 pages. Um, I don't need to you know, go, go through it in detail, but I reckon it would be really good for you guys to just go and have a read of the way that they're, they're written. And... I just go to the first page. So the general conditions in Schedule A, um, authorized petroleum activities and carrying out the petroleum activities, the holder of this environmental authority must not exceed the number and maximum size of each of the specified petroleum acti activities listed in Schedule A Table 1. And it talks about the total number of wells. So about a thousand proposed wells, 
Um, so, you know, it's a massive expansion of wells, development wells, compressor stations. You know, this is regulating a hell of a lot of things. 3,000 regula non-regulated dams, huge amount of activity. So it's a very complicated operation that it's seeking to um, regulate. Then you've got general Excuse conditions me, Chris, like... Yeah, mate? Could I ask a question? Just when you're developing these environmental authorities, are these coming from like a, very, like a multitude of different acts like the, like the EPBC and the EPA, or is it more, more or less from one particular area? That's a great question, Tarkin. And the simple answer is that this focuses principally on the considerations at the state level under the Environmental Protection Act. So this is essentially the state environmental protection regime. They can include cross-references to matters of national environmental significance, but this is essentially focused on environmental protection under the Environmental Protection Act. The petroleum um, tenures don't really provide for environmental protection. This is the environmental protection component of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So um, there's a range of different things that the holder must develop, things like an operational plan, and it must consist of you know, a range of things, maps and series of maps. So you can see all this detail. So you guys, if you're working in this sector, there's a lot of work in, you know, even though these projects have been approved, the actual work in complying with all of these conditions is extensive. So one of the you know, key jobs that you can have as an environmental manager or an environmental scientist or you know, an engineer, um, say you're, you're, you're an environmental engineer and you specialize in wastewater treatment, for instance, you, know, you could be working in, in for Santos, dealing with um, management of the brackish water from coal seam gas extraction. And if you're doing that, then you're operating within this framework and you are trying to ensure that the company complies with things like the plan of op the operation plan and these conditions so that you don't breach them. So they're very detailed. We don't need to obviously know the detail. It's just, I just really wanted to show you an example as you know, the reality of how complicated these things are. There's lots of different plans and the like. One thing I just wanted to mention as well is financial assurance. So when, a, a, when an activity is approved, it typically gets a big set of conditions. For a lot of resource activities, one of the main conditions is a financial assurance which is essentially, it can come in different forms, but the simplest is where a company pays, you know, a, a big amount of money into a bank account that uh, it can't um, remove the money without the approval of the Department of Environment. So that money, let's just say, the, the financial assurance has been a lot of work in the last decade on working this out, but essentially, the financial assurance is intended to cover the likely rehabilitation costs of the activity uh, if the, that fell upon the state. So what can happen and what has happened in the past with a lot of resource projects is the companies go in, it all looks good to start with, they get an approval, they go in, they do the mining or they do the extraction and then when the resource is extracted, the real rehabilitation costs are often really expensive and companies in the past have basically just folded. You know, once the company has, you know, let's just say a gold mine operates for 20 years and the first 15 years it's production and then the last five years it was basically to be winding down and rehabilitation of the site. So it's making money for the first 15 years and then in the past the company you know, if it got to 15 years and basically now it's just looking at all costs, it might just say, well, you know, we, we no longer have the money for that. We've given, we've distributed the money to our shareholders. There's no money left. Sorry, but we can't comply with the conditions. And in which case you'd end up with a degraded site that no one wants to, no one wants to pay for rehabilitation. 
So because it's been such a massive problem in the past, what the state requires is that you put aside money for rehabilitation so that there's no, you know, you don't get a benefit by just doing your mining and then walking away from a degraded site. So that's really what a financial assurance is about. It's putting aside money for rehabilitation so that you can't, you know, um, disappear when it comes time to pay for the rehabilitation. So financial assurance is uh, worth a lot of money. For some sites, big sites, it might be hundreds of millions of dollars. So working that out, so if you think about it from a resource company's perspective, that's a big expense. You're putting aside potentially hundreds of millions of dollars that you you can't really get any return on and it's sort of sitting there in this pot that you can't access but is really part of your capital investment for the project so the amount and how it is provided so there's been different models that have been looked at in some jurisdictions each company pays in like a levy each year and then there's a big pot of money sitting there for the state to call upon if any one mine goes belly up there's different pros and cons to the different approaches. One of the problems with the levy approach is if a company has paid in, you know, a million dollars a year and it's already paid all that and now it's looking at $30 million for um, rehabilitation and it thinks, well, if we walk away now, it's we save $30 million. The sort of payment in system can still work as a perverse incentive to walk away. So really putting aside a whole heap of money for the rehabilitation costs of the individual project is still, um, yeah, there's pros and cons for how you manage the financial assurance, but it's an important component of the um, conditions. So have a look at those conditions. I don't want to spend, I just, I'll draw, point out a couple of things about them, but I'll come back to the slides. So I'll just go back to sharing So can you guys see now the slides again? Yep. So, yeah, so you've got example of environmental authority conditions. Yep, that's correct. Yes. Yep. Okay, so you can go and have a look at the individual document. I won't go through it in, in you know, any more detail, but I just wanted to have you think about an environmental authority like this. And I think a really good analogy for how these regimes are constructed is you can think of it like a castle and many years ago I was in the army and we talked about defense in depth which is an idea that you can have multiple lines of defense that you can fall back to as you know you get overrun and you know you fall back to another line of defense so modern environmental laws have multiple lines of defense in the first instance it might just be the conditions saying to a company when you carry out this activity, once it's completed, you must rehabilitate the site. And so that's an obligation which is backed by a penalty if it fails to comply. But um, that works as long as the company doesn't walk away and go into receivership so that it disappears. Um, so for most companies, like a big company like Santos, they don't want to do that because, you know, they're in business. To, you know, they don't want to develop a bad reputation. So they will generally comply. But then particularly for small and medium sized companies, having a financial assurance is really important because if a company goes into receivership, you need to have some money to draw upon for the state to rehabilitate the site. And then um, Queensland um, developed also recently in 2016, I think it was, another line of defense called the chain of responsibility laws where if and I'll talk about this again next week in relation to the Environmental Protection Act, but just thinking of it in this context, I did this diagram for a talk I gave a few last year about chain of responsibility laws. And you can think about the regulatory issue as how do you ensure rehabilitation of a site? The first line of defense is the conditions of approval. And if you've got an honest uh, operator that's got sufficient funds, then the conditions should deal with it. Then um, the next line of defense is your financial assurance. And similarly, 
you've got your financial assurance is imposed by conditions and provided that the financial assurance is sufficient, then that should deal with it as well. So the conditions and financial assurance are often inter interrelated in that conditions impose a financial assurance requirement. Then you can also go to court uh, against the operator, like the company or director. But what we've had a problem with in the last decade within Queensland in particular has been um, particularly the situation where there's insufficient money set aside for rehabilitation. So that can occur if a project under its normal operation, let's just say the rehabilitation costs are $10 million. And that's what's required in the financial assurance. But something goes wrong and there's a huge pollution incident that costs $100 million to rehabilitate. So the financial assurance is insufficient and the company now you know, doesn't look you know, too healthy financially because it's got this huge rehabilitation cost. And if it's been operating for a few years, a lot of the money might have already gone to shareholders. So what Queensland developed was this thing called chain of responsibility laws where it could give orders to people who basically had gotten the money from, from an operation for the rehabilitation of the site. So they've called chain of responsibility laws. And so in the Environmental Protection Act, there's multiple lines of regulation. And yeah, next week I'll talk about the um, Link Energy prosecution. This was a um, development of underground um, coal gasification that resulted in this huge pollution incident that, uh, yeah, has the company went into receivership and chain of responsibility laws were developed in response to. Uh, so think of, yeah, the Environmental Protection Act a bit like a castle with multiple lines of defence. Conditions of approval are the first line of defence and they can be quite detailed. Uh, and financial assurances are often wrapped up in that. So for a big, big project like the Santos GLNG project, it's got lots of conditions, it's got big financial assurance, all of that sitting there um, for rehabilitation of the sites. So yeah, financial assurances are an important tool for ensuring rehabilitation of damaged sites. Um, I just mentioned as an aside that there's this arrangement that's been developed in the last decade or so called alternative arrangements. And I find them really worrying, but they've become extensively used. They're written into most environmental authorities now in standard conditions. And basically it substitutes the conditions of approval and state enforcement for private agreements with landholders and compensation for less stringent standards. So essentially it allows, um, so see here, this is just an extract from the Santos um, Environmental Authority and the general conditions up here, F7, about noise, emissions of noise from the petroleum activities authorized under this environmental authority must not result in levels greater than those specified in schedule F table one. So that's table one there. And you get times of day, you get the noise levels that are allowed in metrics, and then you get a quantified number. Um, so that's the basic condition. You shouldn't exceed those. So if you think about it, the sort of situation where they're triggered is if you know a farmer has got a series of wells um, on their property and those things are operating and producing noise and it can be really annoying in the middle of the night you've got this well operating and you know so there can be a lot of noise from them and so these conditions of approval are there to basically limit the amount of noise that can be created and then down here in, in F9, it says where alternative arrangements are in place, then the, those limits don't apply. And so a lot of resource companies, a big component of now the regulatory scheme is, is essentially these private agreements linked with um, code and, um, sorry, compensation and conduct agreements. So um, that essentially make um, the, the noise and dust sort of limits, um, you take them from being state level enforcement and you, you take it down to a private agreement where landholders agree to be compensated for essentially the greater noise or dust. 
Um, I've dealt with a, a few of them. I, I can't go into the details of that because of client confidentiality, but I see it as a huge issue for our regulatory system. I talked last week about the lack of enforcement by the state regulator against the Ackland mine and the huge problem of noise from the mine for surrounding landholders and the huge difficulty in enforcing the noise conditions because it's expensive, you require continuous monitoring. Uh, it's, a really, it's really hard and I am really concerned about alternative arrangements because it's, it's even taking out the state regulator, which you know sometimes doesn't do its job very well, like it, with um, Ackland, but essentially it's pushing it down to the individual landholders. And where I've dealt with al these alternative arrangements, uh, the problem I see is enforcement of them. It's very, very difficult to monitor noise and dust, expensive, and yeah, you're at a huge power disparity. Similarly to that, I just mentioned as we pass through, the Water Act 2000 um, uh, has a provision. So groundwater is a big concern to landholders. And so there's this feel-good term in the Water Act about make good agreements for water bores, which is essentially um, a responsibility of tenure holders, particularly petroleum tenure holders, to make good any damage to groundwater bores. And so um, this is section 421 of the Water Act, a make good measure for a water bore um, is any measure ensuring the bore owner has access to reasonable quantity and quality of water for the bore's authorised use or purpose and a plan to monitor the bore and also compensation if a bore's capacity is impaired. So if you imagine you're a, uh, operating a cattle property and you're out in central Queensland, so groundwater is essential. You need, you've got, um, say, uh, half a dozen or a dozen groundwater bores that you extract water from to water your stock. And they are critical to your operation. And if they are damaged by, you know, so the groundwater level in them might be at naturally at 50 meters. And because of loss of groundwater due to coal seam gas development in the area, it drops to 200 meters and you can no longer access um, groundwater or it, the groundwater in the area becomes really saline and you can no longer water your stock. So make good agreements are essentially an obligation on the uh, resource company to fix that or pay for the damage that they've done. Again, a real problem with these is actually enforcement. So i just make this point before I move on. Resource companies are keen to negotiate, make good agreements, compensation and conduct agreements and alternative arrangements at the initial stage of gaining approvals and access. So that, you know, they're keen to negotiate that because it's, it's uh, required of them to get their tenure and get their operations going. The state requires it. But it's likely to be a really different story once you come to enforcement. So, you know, a resource company is keen to agree to it. But then if you say there's a problem, my bore is impacted or I'm, you know, suffering bad noise impacts, you've got to pay me compensation, then uh, you, you face a really different environment where the resource company will often fight you tooth and nail and say, well, you know, there is no impact. That's natural fluctuation in your groundwater bore or you know, we haven't caused those noise impacts, prove that we've breached it. Um, it becomes very different once you're to the enforcement stage and you face this huge power disparity between the resource company, which, you know, potentially a multi-billion dollar company with all the experts and lawyers and the like versus an individual landholder. So I really worry for landholders about make good agreements, the, the CCAs and alternative arrangements. And I, I yeah. So I do a lot of work for landholders and community groups, and you know, I just find these these arrangements really, really difficult to enforce, and often you just don't have the resources. Um, I notice it's 10 to 11. I've really only got, um, say, 10, 15 minutes to go with this lecture. Sorry, going to go a little bit past um, our wrap-up time. Um, but anyway, about 10 minutes to go in this. In this. Um, so... They're the main approval requirements. 
I want to just wrap up with a few things. Um, one of the EIS process, but I also just want to talk about the port and the special provisions applying in the, say, the port of Gladstone, so that you're aware of those as well. So we talked about the EIS process last week in relation to the mining regime and uh, the similar sort of EIS processes process applies for coal seam gas, particularly large projects have an EIS prepared under the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act. Now, I've just got this question for you. Why does Queensland have two EIS processes? Um, we've got one under the Environmental Protection Act, which can cover mining and coal seam gas. And we've got one under the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act that can cover mining and coal seam gas as well as anything else. But why do you think we have two? And I'll give you a hint. The Environmental Protection Act one is managed by the Department of Environment and Science and the State Development one is managed by the Coordinated General's Office. To push forward um, compliance by uh, the industry in the circumstance of the second, the, sec the State Development and Public Works Organization Act. Yeah, Tarkin, I'm not quite sure I'm sure what you're saying there. So could you repeat that? Uh, yeah, so I guess, and I think we previously stated that in like one circumstance, you wouldn't get the DES to be in charge of all approvals due to them having views of um, particularly wanting to enforce compliance, whereas having a body that isn't um, from the DES can... Um, put forward the industry and therefore allow for progression in um, economics or, or project approvals. Yeah, that's a, that's a, I think you've, you've gotten it. So basically um, in government, uh, there's often a hierarchy in the different government departments. So at the top is the premier's department as well as treasury. And so they're the most powerful departments. They, you know, Treasury controls money. So other departments are sort of under that. The state development um, and development, you know, industry sort of departments are also very powerful. And typically, at least historically in Australia and in Queensland, environmental departments have come right down the pecking order. Uh, and there's a perception that they might be green. You know, last week I strongly criticised the Department of Environment and Science, talked about regulatory capture. I think that that's more perception than reality that they are green. Uh, typically they, or often, the Department of Environment and Science is really just uh, an industry department with a little bit of window dressing around environmental issues, that it's, it's no more sort of pro-environment really than the Department of State Development and Planning. But uh, at least uh, from a perception wise, they can be seen as greener. So we've got two EAS processes basically because um, the Coordinator General is there to assist these big projects to get through. So essentially we've put a body that is really about the development of the state in charge of the EIS process. My view is there shouldn't be an EIS process under the State Development and Public Works Organization Act, that the coordinator general is clearly biased and shouldn't be in charge of that process, that it should go to the Department of Environment and Science, even though I'd say in practice that they are also captured by this culture. But um, at a, you know, at a regulatory level, um, it, it just adds extra complications as well as clear bias in our EIS system that the State Development Public Works Organization Act is there. So that's my criticism of it. But the reality is it's there and it's very unlikely to go anywhere. It's, it's you know, industry likes having the coordinator general for these large projects. And um, yeah, uh, can I just, I'll tell you a little anecdote. When I Years ago, um, I was acting for a large developer who had a problem with the Department of Environment in the development of a big canal estate and marina. And they also um, were having a problem with the fisheries department um, with this big project. And the project was like a billion dollars worth of development. And it was sort of going to reclaim land out of a marine park and destroy mangroves. So the fisheries department didn't want that. And the environment department was also you know, didn't want the the damage to the environment. So I remember being in this meeting with the project manager and, 
the guy, you know, push back his chair and and um, use some swear words, which I'll exclude. But basically, he said, you know, so when do we get um, DSD, the Department of State Development, involved? Um, because they're really good. Insert a few expletives here. Um, and they will kick the Department of Environment and Department of Fisheries into line. So essentially, it was the perception that um, the coordinator general would basically lean on the Environment Department and Fisheries Department to get out of the way of this project. So that was, I think, a really, and I think that that is a really common industry perception about why you go to the coordinator general and get your project declared a coordinated project. It's so that you can have them strong arm any environmental concerns that might arise in, you know, parts of the uh, other parts of the government. Okay, so the Coordinator General's website, uh, you can go and have a look at the um, GLNG um, EIS process. And I talked about the, the process last week, so I won't dwell on it here, but you've got an initial advice statement, prepare an EIS, there's often a supplementary EIS, there's an opportunity for public submissions. Um, there were a lot of criticisms of the approval processes uh, back in 2013. This was a front page of the Courier Mail um, dash for gas, bureaucrats pressured to rush CSG approvals. Um, this was basically what the article said. Public servants at two departments tasked with giving the official go ahead to Queensland's new calcium gas industry were blindsided by the Bly government demands that two of the gigantic projects be approved within weeks of each other. Documents obtained by an investigation by the um, newspaper revealed that the 18 billion Santos GLNG project was nearing its approval in May 2010. And at that time, public servants were hit with demands from the government to also tackle the 16 billion QGC project. And then the origin led AP LNG proposal approved in November of the same year. So basically a lot of pressure on the state government officers assessing the projects to basically rush through their approvals. And I'll come back to this in a final lecture of our course and play you a clip from uh, this uh, is a lady called Simone Marsh. She was working in the Coordinator General's office uh, at the time and she essentially became a whistleblower about how the whole approval process was rushed that it wasn't, you know, there wasn't proper consideration of water impacts. And yeah, so talk about that in our final lecture about ethics. So wrapping up a couple, couple of things. I mentioned Regional Planning Interest Act last week. So this legislation really was a response to concerns about impacts of these big resource projects on farmland in particular, but really it came too late to deal with the big uh, CSG LNG projects. It, it applies now, but it didn't apply at the time these projects were being assessed. So it's really you know shutting the gate after the horse is bolted. So I don't need to deal with it any, you know, anymore for our processes. The pipeline approval processes I just mentioned. So looking at one of the Coordinator General's reports for the um, a pipeline process, it, it points out, it lists all the legislation that's required for a pipeline. So you require a pipeline license under the petroleum and gas legislation. You also require an environmental authority under the Environmental Protection Act for a petroleum activity um, and a range of other smaller permits because, you know, you're crossing roads, you're going through rivers, you're impacting on fisheries and the like, um, you know, if you've got a big project. So this project was running from Moranbar, um, 450 kilometers south to Gladstone. So, you know, you're going a long way, you'll cross, cross through a lot of tenures. The approval process is for the hub in Gladstone. So the pipeline goes to Gladstone. Um, and I just mentioned here as well that there's special planning for state development areas under the State Development Public Works Organization Act. So there's areas that are declared state development areas and um, this is just a map. Um, so this again puts the coordinator general in the box seat for controlling them. So here's Gladstone and you've got all these different precincts. And then Curtis Island, this purple area is the um, industry precinct for gas. 
So, and then there's an environmental management precinct is green as well, but you know, this big purple area, that's where the gas sector was developed. And so it's within a state development area. And what that does is it allows the state government and the coordinator general to control development in that area and overrides local government planning schemes. So the local government isn't in control of those areas, the state government is. So yeah, um, in addition to state um, development areas, I'd also just mention port authorities, which are, are another state level sort of authority that's created uh, under the Transport Infrastructure Act, and they control development in strategic port land. And there's land use plans that are prepared and integrated into the Planning Act. So for Gladstone ports, there's a land use plan 2012 that was updated in February 2016. And essentially it links through to the Planning Act. And so if you wanted to develop land in an area that was covered by that plan, then it's um, there's a trigger at a state level under the planning regulations in Schedule 10. And so Schedule 10, strategic port land, accessible development, development on strategic port land is accessible development if it's made accessible development under the land use plan. And the port authority is the assessment manager typically, so not the local government. So ports, um, so there's Brisbane, has Brisbane Ports Corporation, Gladstone, um, Dalrymple, and Abbot Point. All of the major ports on the Queensland coast have these port authorities. So they're sort of like a local government for the, the port. And so, yeah, local governments don't control those areas. So two special categories. You know, local governments are generally in control of land development, but two special categories are land within a state development area and land within... Uh, essentially the major ports. So yeah, here's the Gladstone City planning scheme and essentially it leaves out uh, or it recognises areas that are in the state development um, areas as well as the strategic port lands, but it pretty well doesn't regulate those. Okay, so just... Um, I just wanted to mention those major port considerations and they're linked back to um, so the the gas hub for instance on Curtis Island is approved if it was applied for now it would be approved under the Planning Act but the coordinator general would be in control it's within a state development area so the development of that sort of industrial aspect of the project is dealt with under the Planning Act as opposed to the extraction of the gas which is dealt with under the Petroleum and Gas and Environmental Protection Act. Okay, so final question, are those applications likely to be granted? Well, similar sort of considerations as we dealt with last week in relation to mining, they're broad discretionary decisions with things like the public interest, environmental impacts to consider, but typically no um, uh, quantitative limits on impacts. So for approval of a CSG field, it's very qualitative and as I said last week in relation to mining typically um, you know the money and royalties trumps environmental issues you've still got to deal with the environmental issues through conditions but it's very rare that one of these big projects would be refused okay just wrapping up uh, you can have a look at the Santos GLNG project and the coordinator general's website you can see the EIS is there and you know a whole range of documents I would like you to look at the environmental authority on the blackboard side. Just skim read it. You know, it's just you really I think it's just so important that you understand the complexity of these sorts of approvals of in the you know reality. So we can look at these the approval process and you know identify the different approvals that are required, but there is so much work for you in your careers in implementing the conditions of approvals and yeah, they're very complicated so being aware of them um, is really useful okay take home points um, mining and petroleum is accepted development under the planning act therefore the da process doesn't apply to them the definitions of mineral and petroleum are key to understanding what activities are exempt under from the planning regime and there's different regimes exist at a state level for tenures and royalties versus environmental protection mining and petroleum offshore and onshore 
and state development areas and ports have special planning regimes and that last point is one I've just made. So that's the lecture. Um, any questions? I have a question. Yep. Uh, when they, when companies have to put in their, um, oh, what was it called? The financial assurance. Yep. Do they pay interest on that for the whole time the government holds it? Great question, Lisa. Uh, there's different forms it can be put in. Um, the main one, so I... You know, all of these areas are so complicated. You really get involved. You really get to know them if you work in them. So for me, it's generally when I've been involved in litigation. Uh, so a few years ago, I acted for the Department of Environment in litigation by a gold company, um, a gold miner who had had a financial assurance, I think, for one million um, dollars in a bank guarantee. And then the... Um, department had basically done a review of the whole state and realized that all of its financial assurances were way, way, way too low. So it went through this massive process of increasing the financial assurances. And I think this gold company went from having a million dollars required for its financial assurance to having, I think it was $12 million required. And it um, disputed that. And there was an appeal process for, for it to... Um, to be, you know, to challenge the assessment by the department. Uh, but basically the money there was held just in a bank guarantee. So mm -hmm. the interest presumably would, you know, be accruing, but a very low rate um, for the company. So yes, it would get its interest because ultimately if it completes its project and it rehabilitates the site, the government will release the financial assurance. So you get the money backed plus interest. So yes, you do get interest, but it's at a really low rate because essentially you can't, you know, like you can't put it into some risky venture. Like you can't just, you know, give a financial assurance and say the company shares or something like that, where which might be earning like most resource companies want 20 or 30% return on their investment. So if you've got a financial assurance that's only returning like one or 2% in interest, then, you know, that's, that's a really bad you know, you don't want that because it's a huge amount of capital that's really earning very little. Um, so does that answer your question? Yeah, I suppose I was thinking that if the company did go um, belly up, then the government had to pay for the rehabilitation and would that match um, the cost of re rehabilitation? Yeah, well, it depends yeah. very much first on the estimate and how much the financial assurance you, you know, you had actually, whether you got it right. It's actually really hard. So the example I just used of the gold mining company, so they had a million dollars set aside and then they did a calculation and they realized if they had to rehabilitate it, it'd be more like 12 million. So then there was the dispute over whether that was actually correct or not. And the gold mining company was saying they could rehabilitate it for a lot less than 12. But the government has to take the position that if the company isn't there anymore, that if it has to pay for it and pay for some, you know, company to come in and rehabilitate a site, what does it likely, you know, what's it likely to have to pay? So it's actually really hard to work that out. And that's why it's been, yeah, there's been quite a lot of work in the last decade in Queensland about that. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? I think there's one in chat. Uh, sorry, was there one in chat? What was that? Um, so... I, I can't see any... Um, questions in the chat am i missing that the zoom group chat no i think it was just a thanks for the lecture <laughs> oh okay cool um okay so i just i don't want to uh i just want to emphasize don't be stressed about this um you know the, the any details that i've covered in this lecture i really just want you to be aware of 
okay, so there's this whole regime for calcium gas and petroleum extraction. It's different to planning. It's different to the mining regimes. There's a lot of similarities though to the mining regimes. And also at the end of the lecture, I just mentioned, you know, state land or the, you know, the state development areas, as well as uh, the large ports that they have sort of their own sort of special regimes that are essentially state level uh, that take away the control of local governments. So for instance, if you're working in Brisbane and say you work for Brisbane City Council and there is a development out of the port of Brisbane, Brisbane City Council won't really be involved in the assessment of it. It will be the Port of Brisbane Authority that deals with it. So it's sort of just what I'm just trying to do is fill in the blanks for you so that we're building up as we go through this course, we're building up all the different you know, sort of elements of this complicated regime so that you're broadly aware of them and uh, you're not just lost in the complexity when you get out there in the workforce. That's really what I'm trying to achieve. Don't be stressed um, now about, you know, any of the, the, you know, like I'm not going to ask you any questions about the conditions of the Santos Environmental Authority approval. What I'm really doing is just providing that to you as an example so you can see them. And, you know, when you're then in the workforce in, you know, a year's time or two years time, you're not coming across these sorts of documents for the first time and that, you, you know, you know how complicated they are, but also how important they are in practice and how significant they are financially for companies as well as, you know, and the difficulties with regulation. It's actually really complicated and really hard to manage these massive projects that are occurring over decades involving huge amounts of money with a lot of monitoring and a lot of changes as you go along. And then, you know, it's really hard. Okay, so that's, yeah, don't be stressed about this is, I suppose, a key point. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, let's uh, wrap up uh, and I will see you guys tomorrow or talk to you tomorrow for the chutes. And uh, yeah, look forward to it. Thanks, everyone.